morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like you to open your Bibles. Second Corinthians six eighteen. Second Corinthians six eighteen. It reads like this. It says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word guides us, your word strengthens us, your word instructs us. Help us today to see that your word also pours out love on us. Help us to see that you treasure us. Help us to see that we belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody has one of those little names, one of those pet names, one of those names of affection that you carry with you. Now, sometimes your family knows about it. Maybe your wife gave it to you. Maybe it's one of those things from your childhood. Oh, yeah, mom called me, my mom called me a perfectly delightful child. Uh, well, or, or some variation of that uh, for my initials are PDC she's not here to dispute that so we're going to go with that as the gospel truth nonetheless we all received from someone one of those little names and right this moment I want you to remember that name and I want you to jot it on top of your notes you're going to need it you don't have to show it to anybody but right now jot it down that name that nickname that name of affection that that family moniker that was given to you could be something very simple you know for couples it might be sweetheart or honey bunch or baby doll or whatever for kids it might be little stinker or you know rosebud or whatever there's an important reason why you remember that name we're going to talk about that in a moment. So today, the name of this message is, your name is on God's lips. Your name is on God's lips all the time. What's in the name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. William Shakespeare. They say we die twice. Once when the last breath leaves our body, and once when the last person we know speaks our name. The great philosopher Al Pacino. There's nothing sweeter in this sad world than the sound of someone you love calling your name. That's Kate DiCamillo from The Tale of Despero. I love nicknames. It makes me feel loved. It makes me feel less alone in this world. Ellen Page. When you love someone, you say their name differently. It's like it's safe inside your mouth. Jody Picoult. Remember my name and you head to my feeling of importance. Dale Carnegie. He said my name the way diabetics talk about hot fudge Sundays. That's Mary Janice Davidson. The sole reason for a child's middle name is so they can tell when they're really in trouble. Anonymous. And finally, I am the daughter of a king who is not moved by the world. For my God is with me and goes before me. I do not fear, for I am his, and I bear his name. So the world talks about names, and they recognize some importance out of a a uh, particular journal of marketing, uh, December 2022, it says, names are important things. Our name represents our identity as well as our personal history, family background, and our connection to our community and our culture. It's part of who we are and it's an aspect of what makes us a unique individual. The power of names is deeply personal, which means hearing our own name can have a profound psychological effect. Remembering someone's name and then repeating it back to them makes them feel important, valued, and seen. It also helps build a bond between the two of you and strengthen the relationship that you have. So even the world recognizes the importance of names, but names are important, particularly to God. You may recall that he gave new names to people that he loved deeply and used mightily. For example, Abram, father, 
became Abraham, the father of multitudes. Sarai, his wife, her name means princess, and yet she became Sarah, the mother of nations. Jacob, the usurper, the deceiver, became Israel, let God prevail. When you enter into a new and deeper relationship with God, he often applies a new name to you. He did then, he does now. And so I'd like to take a moment and consider a few of the names that he's applied to us as his children. So you can jot this down, you can just listen. But number one, he says we're alive. There are about 15 of these. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, we're alive in Christ. Alive, we've been dead. Dead, 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 dead in our sins. We're alive. He says we're beloved by the God of the universe. Beloved. That's 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. We're not just okay. We're not just tolerable. We're not just, hmm, I'm lukewarm about you. No. He's passionate and loves us with a love we scarcely can comprehend. We're blessed. Blessed Ephesians 1, 3 and 1, 7 remind us that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. All the things that he poured out on Christ, all the things that Christ possesses, he pours that out on us in endless, endless, endless opportunities and examples throughout our entire life. We're blessed. We're blessed with things that normally we don't see on earth that are confined to heavenly places. We're blessed with those not just given them. They're not just laid out there on the table. They're poured out on us. We're chosen. Did you know that? You were chosen before the foundation of the world. You weren't just a happy accident. You went, oh, hey, maybe I'll believe in Jesus. And Whoops. Gosh, God didn't see that coming. Oh, no. Oh, no. He selected you before anything existed. He said, you are mine. You're chosen. You mean something to him. Think about when you pick out a pet. You go and you look and there are 50 puppies here and 29 over here and you choose the one. Well, imagine that in some astronomically larger sense. God looks at all the souls of the world and he says, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose you. You're not just choosing me. I'm choosing you. He's very intentional, purposeful. He's got a reason for choosing you. And it wasn't because you were a great guy. It wasn't because you're smart. It wasn't because you've got stylish good looks. It wasn't because you were going to sing and dance. He chose you for something that only he could see, which was what was to be in your heart. But he chose you not by accident, but by design. He tells us that we're complete. That's Colossians 2.10. Complete. Well, if we're complete in him, then we must have been incomplete before. Lacking a little, lacking a lot. Imagine your jigsaw puzzle, the thousand pieces, 300, 400 are missing. There's a whole lot to be filled in. When you become a child of God, God completes you. He says, I'm going to put in you all the things that you lack. You lack humility. I'm going to help you be humble. You lack charity. I'm going to help you be charitable. You lack obedience. I'm going to help you be obedient. You lack, I will supply. And the nice part is we don't have to go, I have to take a self-inventory and see what it is that I lack. Whoops, I forgot about that one. You know, he knows exactly what you lack. And he gives it to you in abundance. Not as an angry father yelling at you, screaming at you, but as a loving father who wants you to be complete and full and enjoy the full measure of goodness and godliness that's available. So he wants to complete you. You're also family. Now, for some who grew up in a big family, hey, I've got a lot of good memories, a few bad ones. For some who had no family, the whole thing is a little bit foreign. But you're part of a family now. Whatever you were before, you're part of a very large family. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. People you know. People you will never meet. People who all love the same God and receive the same blessings poured out over and over. 
So family is 1 John 3, 1 and 2, and 2 Corinthians 6, 18. Your family. You're forgiven. Before you came to Christ, you probably didn't have any inkling of how much debt you were carrying, how much sin your life was filled with. Maybe you did. Maybe you were wise. Or maybe you were oblivious like I was. Yeah. But you know, you're, you're hauling around more than a semi-load. You're hauling around all kinds of trouble you have no idea of. And when you come to Christ, God says, I remember that. Not at all. Like the, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far my, your sin is from you. Because the price has been paid. You're clear, you're free, you're done. You are forgiven. Inherent in that, then, maybe we should be taking that forgiveness seriously. Instead of carting around that old stuff. Oh yeah, well, you know, God said I was forgiven, but, you know, I can't forgive myself. That was me. I'm going to drag around this malarkey from the, my past. I'm going to carry it around and I'm going to burden myself down and I'm going to use it to keep me from doing anything. I'll never go anywhere. I'll never move forward because I want to haul this big heavy weight on my shoulders. Imagine picking up a semi-tractor trailer of 80,000 pounds. Scrawny little dude like me trying to cart that around. Impossible. God says, no, forgiven, forgiven. Take him seriously. Take him at his word. It's done. If you've confessed that sin, if you've repented of that sin, it's done. He erases it off the whiteboard. It's gone. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he separated you from that. Take that forgiveness. That's Ephesians 1.4. Not only that, but you're free. Free from sin and then power of sin and the corrupting influence of sin, free from the futility of the human mind. You've been given the mind of Christ. You've been freed from the penalties of sin that you've been carting around. Whether you knew it or not. There's a scene in uh, the uh, Christmas Carol where Jacob Marley appears to Scrooge. It's a warning. Jacob Marley is burdened with heavy locks and chains, and depending on which episode you see, these chains are as big as anchor chains on an aircraft carrier. And the explanation is, this is the weight of the sin that you're carrying. Imagine that that's just a drop in the bucket. And you're so burdened down by this that it crushes you. You can't carry it. You can hardly breathe. But when you come to Christ and you confess those things, you are free. My chains fall off. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. You're free. Now, if you have no idea what you've been carting around, then maybe you don't have any appreciation for what, from what you're freed from. If, on the other hand, you have any inkling of the stuff that's in the back, you realize this freedom is something really hard to grasp and pretty exciting. You're free. Galatians 5.1, Romans 6.6, 6, Romans 8.2. He calls us a friend. Uh, you know, we get called a lot of things in life. And normally someone you're mortal enemies with doesn't turn around and call you friend very quickly. And yet God says, you are my friend if you're in Christ. I can sit down at his table and eat. Sworn enemies before, family, friends now. Oh, if we could make the world of men work like that. But God is magnanimous in ways we can scarcely understand. And he grants us that. You are my friend. I am your friend. All through the blood of Christ. That's John 15, 15, by the way. We're heirs. Now, my family was original pioneer of Fort Collins. We had a lot of property, and ultimately those farms were sold as the population increased, development came along. The money from those farms were put in trust funds, and ultimately some of that came to me. I was an heir to a fortune that was started in 1873. So 1873 to 2007, long time. 
I was not a Rockefeller, no, no, anything like that. Nonetheless, there were things handed down to me from my family. If you're the heir of the God of the universe, think of the riches that you receive. We're not talking about gold bars, and diamonds and jewels. We're not talking about that. But think about the riches you have of forgiveness and love and faithfulness and obedience. Think of the riches where your life makes a difference for you and for those around you. That you can affect somebody's eternal destination by the way you handle the, the gifts you are given. You're an heir to all the riches of Christ. I don't know how much that is. How big is heaven? How, how much did I inherit? I can't even comprehend. But God tells us we've got it all. All. So that, doesn't, that means that everything that Jesus receives, I'm going to receive too. In some measure, I'm as beloved by God, as blessed by God, as forgiven, all these things. And things I, he, he even describes them in ways we can't comprehend. But I'm an heir. And oh, by the way, that contract is already signed. It's a done deal. It isn't something that might happen. No, nope, it's already a done deal. You're an heir if you're a believer in Christ. That's Romans 8, 17 and Galatians 4, 7. This one I like. In some translations, it says you're God's handiwork. Uh, but in one translation, it says you are God's masterpiece. Oh, does that make me feel good? God considers me his masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10, by the way. When I think about that, I think of something that he's labored over for a long, long time. Effort, worry, thought, concern, focus. Like someone who's carving an inter, inter, uh, intricate uh, statue or someone who's painting a magnificent portrait all the labor and time and love that went into that and he calls me he calls you his masterpiece his workmanship and he created us for a specific reason and that is good works Matthew 5 16 let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good deeds and praise your father in heaven the good works we're created for are not for our benefit, but for those around. So we're his masterpiece, his handiwork, his best. We're also a new creation. You know, you get a new car, it's pretty exciting. You get a new microwave, maybe not so exciting. We did that today. Uh, you get a new uh, uh, sofa, you get a new pair of shoes, a new creation. Well, God took care of the old one presents us as new creations. That means what's inside, what drives us, what motivates us, what sustains us, it's all new. The focus is new. Instead of the focus of being on me and the world, it's on him. He gives me the ability to say no to sin, where before it was pointless. As a new creation, all of the things that contaminated and confused me those are all aside. They're gone. New creation in Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 5.17 also. He calls you a precious jewel. Now, I like to think of, you know, you go into Jarrett and you see all the diamonds and over here all the emeralds and here are the rubies and the sapphire. You know, they're all pretty and I've always been attracted to emeralds. So I think of this gigantic thing and it's perfectly cut and it sparkles and it's gorgeous. He calls you a perfect jewel, a precious jewel, and not just the gems of the world. He in fact says, eh, no, 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 that's nothing. That's, that's a bunch of sand. I'm talking about something far greater. He calls you his precious jewel. Now, for any of you who happen to possess any kind of jewelry of any significance, you know, you kind of take care of it. You watch it. You make sure you don't leave it laying around. You take that ring off when you're going to do something that might muck it up. You want to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the gold is always there, that the, fi the fitting is tight, that the stone isn't loose. If we put in 
even a few minutes every day worrying about it. Think about God looking at you every moment and saying, you are my precious jewel, and I'm going to protect you and care for you because you are that valuable to me. Isaiah 43, 4, you're his precious jewel. He calls us priests. I've been called a lot of things. Priest was not one of them. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Priest. You know, the whole model is sinful man can't face holy God, so we need an intermediary. And prior to Christ, we had the priesthood. So you had the high priest. He went into the Holy of Holies, got near to God once a year, and that was a scary time. And then you had a lot of priests working outside. There were layers upon layers upon layers because we stunk so bad with sin, we couldn't get anywhere near the presence of God. Then along comes a perfect high priest who gave his life for us, that man, Jesus Christ. And suddenly that curtain is torn, that separation is gone, and I don't need an intermediary. I don't have to go and say, da 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 da. There isn't a church hierarchy that I need. I have direct access to God. I can be in the Holy of Holies without fear of being burnt to a crisp. I have access to the Most High God directly because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that makes me a priest. A priest. That's not a vocation I ever imagined, and yet God calls me a priest. I'm also redeemed. That's Ephesians 1.7. Think about your mortgage. If you own a home, you take out a mortgage, and usually it's 20 or 30 years. It's a long time because it's a big chunk of change. Um, when my house was built in 1968, it was $15,600. With the crazy market in Fort Collins now, it's around $700,000. If somebody said, hey, you know what, why don't you, uh, I'll, you can buy my house across the street, it's uh, 695000 I probably wouldn't be able to reach in my pocket and go, hey, hang, hang on, let me write you a check for that. And that check being any good, that's a whole lot of money. How do I redeem that mortgage? Well, you spend 30 years paying and paying and paying to the last payment and then finally that debt is paid. In life, we're redeemed from that world of sin and darkness with a price that was mighty, so high we couldn't pay it. Your life. That's the price. Your life. So Jesus steps in and says, I will give my life in your place. I will pay your note in full. Let me go down to the bank. We're going to, get, we're going to find out how much is this. And, and he had the money in the account to pay. He could do it. Boy, he paid with his own blood for my life. He redeemed me. He redeemed you. You are all paid in full. You don't carry any debt. No debt for sin. That's done. If you're a believer in Christ, you're free. You're redeemed. He also calls us righteous, which is always an interesting thing. You look at your life and you go, ha, 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 ha. righteous? Because of what Christ did. He looks at Christ and he says, your righteousness is perfect. You've paid for them. They have your righteousness. That's one of those things as a human, it's hard to wrap your head around. But he calls us righteous for a reason. Because we are like him and becoming more and more like him, Jesus. And Jesus is the righteous one. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21 and Ephesians 4.24. We're righteous, right before God. Really? I always think about the Wizard of Oz and, you know, they go trembling in there and it's kind of scary and there's this big booming noise and big voice and okay so if this is my human vision of God there isn't the little guy behind the curtain oh no that big voice that big booming voice that big scary thing that is the real God and here I am the cowering lion about to you know wet myself running out of there as fast as I can because I'm terrified God says you know no no come back you're right before me all the problems that we had before, they're all settled. You and I, were square. 
You're righteous. I'm also called a saint. Now, that one, I have to laugh. But you're saints, all of us. Saints. We're something we've never been before and could never be on our own. We're pure. We're righteous. We're good. We're bought and paid for. We got washed and polished up, got all those wild hairs taken care of. We're clean before the God of creation, only because of the blood of Christ. That's uh, Colossians 1 2, Ephesians 1 1, and Philippians 1 1, where you're called saints. God also calls us sons and daughters. You know, belonging to a family, that means something to me. I had a big family, and there were some meaningful relationships there, a lot of good memories, an identity there. Well, we're now sons and daughters of the Most High. That was 2 Corinthians 6.18. I am your father, and you are my sons and daughters. He said to me, you are my son. I didn't have to go to him and say, oh, please, 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 please adopt me. Please, I'm worth, uh, yeah, I'm good, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be good. No, no. Mm -mm. When I gave my life to Christ, when I repented, when I truly surrendered, he said, you are now my son. I'm going to give you my name. I'm going to give you my reputation. I'm going to give you all that I have as a son of God. I belong to him now. If you would ask me, who are you? Who's your father? My father in heaven? I belong to him. And finally, he calls you treasure. <coughs> treasure. I've been called a lot of things, and treasure was never one of them. That's Deuteronomy 7, 6, by the way. <coughs> when you think of treasure, you think of that chest with the pirates on it, and they open it up, and there's all that stuff. Think of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, that cave where they had the mountains of fancy chalices and uh, gold coins and jewels. And, 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 okay, well imagine that mountain being higher than any mountain on earth. God looks at you and says, you are my treasure. I look at all this other stuff and it means nothing to me compared to you. Your worth, your value to me is far beyond all that earthly stuff. All the gold in Fort Knox, all the diamonds of South Africa, all the precious jewels, all the money, all the Bitcoin, all that. It doesn't mean anything. You are more precious than all of that. You are my treasure and I will guard you with my heart. So imagine the God of the universe loves you so much that he is defending you, he is watching over you, he is guarding you moment by moment because you are a treasure to him. A treasure to the God of the universe. Did you know that there are 641 statements about how God feels about you and thinks about you in the Bible? That from a website called characterbuildingforfamilies.com. 641 times God says something positive about you. Another 60, he says positive things about what you're doing. So nearly 700 times God says something warm and fuzzy as opposed to, yeah, you're no good, you're not worth it, you're da -da 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 -da. yeah, he says a few of those too. Why do you suppose he keeps telling us that we're valuable? Why do you suppose he keeps telling us that he loves us? Why do you suppose he calls us family and free and blessed and forgiven and heirs and treasure? Why do you suppose that is? Is it because he's insecure in our relationship? I don't think so. I think he's a little smarter than we are. We recognize that the only thing you hear from the world is blah, blah, blah. Mostly bad stuff. You stop and think, just in the last day or two, when was the last time you flicked on a headline that wasn't bad policy, bad politics, bad people, bad stuff? A lot of the negative talk. Well, the world wants to tear you down. It wants to chew you up and spit you out. Why? Well, who's, who's the father of this world? Oh yeah, he's the PR guy that uh, runs the negative campaign. That's that Satan guy. 
And words, words are the weapons of choice right now. In this effort, their new terms get invented, new acronyms, new letters. Uh, old words get redefined and re distorted, and lies become my truth. Um, up is down, left is right, and right, right is definitely wrong. You know, everything that is godly is attacked as hate. So those words, those words that are attacking you every day, it's hard to ignore them as they tear you down, as they beat you down, as they crush you, as they discourage you. And so God uses words of affirmation, not just to counter that nonsense, but to tell you the truth about who you are. You are my beloved. I am your father and you are my sons and daughters. God loves you. So when you feel down, when you go, oh, I'm just, I can't take any more ists or phobes or any of this stuff, just remember, your name is on God's lips. And if you're wondering, he thinks you're terrific. So an application question for you. What does God call you? And why do you think he chose that name? I'm not talking about Peter or David or Bud. Why does he choose these names for you? And how does that make you feel? When he tells you you're his beloved, his precious jewel, his masterpiece, how do you feel? What do, you do you believe him when he says you're his beloved, that you're a precious jewel, a treasure? Do you believe that? If not, what's keeping you from believing it? Is God true to his word? Does God you know, stretch the truth? Does God ever tell you something that isn't true? Finally, do you live your life like you're his masterpiece? If not, what's standing in the way? God loves you with an everlasting love, a love beyond our comprehension. And he tells us over and over and over and over and over in his word how valuable we are. Let's spend some time believing the truth and ignoring the lies that are everywhere else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a good father, a loving father. We have no concept of the height, the breadth, and depth of your love, and yet you pour it out on us so many ways over and over. Help us, Father, every time we pick up your word to see your love. Help us to see that you care so much for us that so you will do anything to redeem us and to pr protect us and to make us like your son. Thank you, God, for your words of affirmation. Thank you for your word of truth. In Jesus' name, amen.